I'm sitting here beside one of my ginkgo trees. Now ginkgos are great plants. In the fall they have these great yellow leaves. But this tree is kind of special. The leaves all turn yellow and then they all fall at the same time. Well, at least that's what people on the internet say. When I read things like that, I always have to ask, does this make any sense? Is this really true? And that's one of the things I do on my gardenmist.com blog. I look at these things. Now, most of my topics are much more serious for the gardener. This is just a fun fact. Do all these leaves fall at the same time, like in one night? Well, I can tell you earlier in the week, this tree was beautiful and yellow. Now they're all on the ground. There's one leaf left on this tree. Well, it turns out that they don't all fall at the same time. That never made any sense, but they do tend to fall over a fairly narrow period of time. If you want to read about more ginkgo mess, hop on over to my website, gardenmess.com, and I have a whole blog post that just talks about ginkgo mess. If you don't grow ginkgos, have a look at them. Now, some of them are large trees like this, but I also have ginkgos that are only this big. You can get a ginkgo to fit any size garden, and they're beautiful trees. Back to the purpose of this video. This is one of my chores videos, and I'm creating a whole series of these, and each one of these will deal with five to eight topics, two minutes a piece. I wanna make the videos fairly short. All of them have to do with things that I do in the garden or things that you should do in the garden. I don't always follow the rules, as you know. In this one, we're going to have a look at a number of different things. I'm going to introduce you to the Russian mallow, which is a great garden plant that almost nobody grows. And I'm going to use it as an example to show you how to keep large perennials smaller in your garden. Then we'll have a look at two different plants and I want to collect seeds from these and both of them create a problem for me. And I'm going to show you how I overcome those problems. Then I'll have a look at one of my favorite hydrangeas and also a hosta that grows near it. And then I'm going to take you into the garden where I modified one of my beds and I put in some castor beans and we're going to review how that went. And I'm going to go through the process I used to evaluate a garden and plan changes for next year. I think it's important that you go from garden to garden through your property, look at everything, figure out what's working and what's not, and make plans to improve it for next year. Now we're sitting here in the fall, it's clearly fall, you got all the leaves on the ground, but I shot this video earlier in the year. It's kind of mid to late summer. Enjoy the video. This is an unusual plant that very few gardeners grow and it's really a shame. It's a Russian mallow. It has these nice white flowers and now that it's started flowering, it will flower pretty much till frost. Now you won't see this, but standing beside it, I can tell that it's just covered in bees. And these are all honeybees. A friend of mine has now put some hives at the back of the property, so I have my own bees to pollinate my plants. And it's great. And we've noticed that ever since the hives were put on the property, we're seeing a lot more bees on our plants. They just love the pollen in here. Now this plant does have a downside. It grows really large. Now normally at this time of year, this plant would already be up to here somewhere. And it gets even taller as it grows. Now one way to overcome that is that you can prune it back in late spring, early summer. A couple months ago, this plant was about this high, and I came along and cut two feet off of everything. Just cut it straight across. You can't kill this thing, it'll just regrow. So now I have it flowering a little lower than normal, and for this spot, I think it just fits at this height. Now if I wanted even shorter, I could have come along and pruned it a second time, or I could even made the first prune even lower. So to some extent, you can control the height of your perennials by doing an early pruning. Of course, if you do it too late in the year, it won't have enough time to make the flowers. Pruning like this normally delays flower production by a couple of weeks. Now, some of the mallows are quite weedy and they seed all over the place. This one doesn't seem to have that problem. 
I actually had it sitting behind the camera in an area and it just got too small for it and that's why I moved it over here. It was also a bit too shady over there. I think it likes full sun. So it's much happier here. It also grows a little larger. I have now found two seedlings in the garden, but I've had the plant for eight to 10 years. And if all I get is two seedlings, that's not a problem for me. See if you can find this plant, the Russian mallow. Do you grow thalictrums in the garden? If not, you really should. I grow about a dozen different kinds and they're all great plants. Many of them give you good height in the garden and lots of color. They're fairly easy to grow. They love part shade, but will also grow in full sun or full shade. This plant here is Thalictrum aquilegiafolia. You might recognize the name aquilegia. It's the name used for columbine. And if you have a look at the leaves on these plants, they look just like columbines, except the flowers are very different. Now, some of these come much shorter. So I have some that are only about this tall. And I also have some that grow much taller. They also flower at different times of the season. Some are in flower right now, and this one was flowering about six, eight weeks ago. It's completely finished now. And these are the brown seed heads. One of the things I've noticed about this plant is that it seeds around quite a bit. In fact, a little too much for me. Now it's pretty easy to pull out, so that's not really a big problem. But if I leave all these seed heads, I'm gonna have babies everywhere. So what I do about this time of the year is I come along and cut these off. And the easiest way to do that is just get your pruners, cut down here, discard that part of the plant. I don't cut all the seed heads because I do want some babies. Some of my friends like these plants and I always want a few coming up here and there. So I'll leave one or two flower heads in the garden. The rest are cut off. This here is one of my Jack in the pulpits and it's native to Ontario. I actually purchased this plant from a plant sale and it was just starting to grow and nobody knew what the new growth was, including me. I'd never really seen the Jack in the Pulpit when it was only a couple inches tall. So I thought, eh, I gotta have it. So I bought it even though I didn't know what it was. As soon as it got a little taller, of course, I knew what the plant was, but you can never have too many Jacks in the garden. This is a nice plant here. It's made some babies down here, but I want more of these. I want to propagate these. So one of the things I do is I come along and I put on one of these organza bags. This is covering the seed head. And right now the seeds are nice and green, but when they're ripe, they'll be a bright red. The problem I have in this garden is that even though these are apparently toxic, some kind of animal comes and eats these on me. If I put the organza bag on, they leave it alone. So it's protecting it against the critters. I'll come along here in September, October, once these are good and red, harvest the seeds, plant them up. And these are erysemas, jack in the pulpits, and they're pretty easy to grow from seed. In a few years, I'll have hundreds of these growing all over the property. But this time of the year, you should start thinking about the seeds that you want to collect and keep your eyes on those. Some of those seeds are ready now. Others, you'll have to wait a few more months. Make a list of the plants you want to collect from and then monitor them at least once a week. Go out and look at them and see if those seeds are ready. Let me show you another plant I collected seeds from this morning. This plant here is one of my favorites. It's the gas plant. And when it's flowering, it's always the star of the garden. Now it flowered quite a few weeks ago. It still has some stems on here with the seed heads on them. And I wanted to collect seeds from this. I grow a bunch of these from seed every year because it's not real popular nurseries. And so my friends are always looking for the plant and I put it in our master gardener plant sale. The tricky part about getting seeds is you have to collect them at the right time. The pods are still quite green. They have this reddish tinge to them. And by the way, they're extremely fragrant. They're oily, lemony smelling. It's one of the great features of this plant. But once these seeds are ready, there's a mechanism inside that actually ejects the seed out. So I can come along one day and look at it and say, oh, it's not ready yet. Come along next week and all the seeds are gone. You have to be very careful with this plant. 
If you want to collect seeds with this plant, you have to keep an eye on it. Now, one way you know it's ready is by shaking it. You probably can't hear that, but I can hear the seeds rattling inside. The other thing you can do is simply open up one of the pods. Look for those black seeds. As soon as they're black, you can harvest them. I was out this morning looking at these and a few have already popped on their own. I checked a couple more and the seeds are black, so I harvested this morning. I left a few on the plant just to show you in the video. Go around your garden, figure out what seeds you want to collect and mark those plants. Then keep an eye on them. This is hydrangea quick fire. It's been blooming for about a week now and the flowers are starting to get that pinkish tinge. Do you know why they call it quick fire? Well, it's one of the first paniculata type hydrangeas to flower in the garden. And it's a great plant, easy to take care of. Prune it a little bit and lay winter, early spring, and just leave it alone. There's nothing else to do for this plant. In front of this plant, you'll also notice a large hosta. This is summon substance. It makes very large leaves and it's flowering now. And you can see the flowers are quite nice on hostas. I don't understand why people cut them off. One of the chores I do on a regular basis is I stop to smell the roses. Now there actually is a little rose here. And it does have a bit of fragrance. This is actually a rose I've had for many, many years. It's a beautiful little thing. I don't really do much maintenance except cut it back in the spring. But as I'm going around the garden, I always ask myself, do I like this? Are the plants working well together? Now, if I have a look here, I tried something new this year, and that's these castor beans, these dark leaf castor beans. And I think these are just fantastic. And they go so nicely with the white hydrangeas. Now on the right here, we have the smooth leaved hydrangea. And on the left, we have another paniculata. And I think the white and the red go so well together. The problem with the castor bean is it's an annual plant and I don't grow a lot of annuals. I just wanted to try this one and see how it would look in the garden. And I really love it. I'm hoping it makes seeds, but so far, no luck. Now you might have read that castor beans are really toxic, and that's correct. The seeds of these plants contain a compound called ricin, and it's one of the most deadly compounds on earth. But it's organic, and it's natural. Okay, the fact that something's synthetic or organic or natural tells you nothing about toxicity. This is one of the most toxic plants you can have. Now the leaves themselves are not that toxic. Most of that ricin is in the seeds. So if you don't want the seeds, just deadhead the flowers when they come out. Anyways, I'm hoping to get some seeds for next year. But it's not a perfect garden. Down here I have a little daylily. And it did flower this year, but it's overshadowed by the plants around it. They're getting too big for the daylily. So either that plant needs to be moved out front here where there's more space and we can enjoy it, or it has to be taken out of the bed completely. Now this hydrangea over here has been there for many, many years. And in fact, it was already out to here and it was too large. So last year when I went through this process, I said to myself, you know what? It's time to move that back. Let's get it near the back so we can have something else in front. That's worked out pretty good because now I can see this space a whole lot better. A lot of my daffodils grow here in the early part of the year. 